Okay. I'm going to hold the mic as if I need to with uh, as loud as I speak and sometimes say I speak too often. Uh, my name is Andy Mahalshik from Eyewitness News, WBRE TV based in Wilkesbury. Welcome to the fourth gang up anti-gang conference. It was started last year, as most of you know, those of you who are not aware of it, it was started as an effort to do something about, which we all know and the facts back it up, uh, increasing gang activity in northeastern Pennsylvania. And the Department of Justice talked about Hazelton being one of the uh, hot spots for gang activity along the entire East Coast. So they started this anti-gang program again. It was summer of last year. We had three other programs. Each program, we make progress in uh, fighting back against gangs, a pushback, and getting more community involvement. So I'm glad to be part of it. I was honored to be asked to moderate once again, because unfortunately, a lot of the folks in this room that I meet are on the scenes of these crimes. Many of them are gang-related or have a gang connection. And again, the bottom line is keeping our community safer, but also making sure our schools are safe, and the school districts have really uh, been involved in this program, uh, making it successful, because that's where the gangs, as you'll hear tonight, they lure, they uh, attract gang members as young as eight, nine, 10 years old. And I'll let the experts talk about that. We have a distinguished panel here tonight, including uh, two FBI agents, one who is trained in anti-gang street units. We'll talk, we'll hear from him momentarily. I want to thank, of course, this is co-sponsored. It was a bipartisan effort by Congressman Lou Barletta from the 11th District and State Senator John Udichek, a Democrat from the 14th District. They got together and said, what can we do to make a difference and make our community better and get people involved? We all know that unless people get involved, we can sit here and talk all night long. But unless our neighborhoods get involved and people in, in, on the streets get involved and everyone buys into it, it's that much harder for uh, uh, law enforcement. And it's not just a law enforcement problem, it's prevention and being proactive. We want to, in the beginning now, the effort has gained the attention of Governor Tom Corbett, who also gave tonight a letter of recommendation, a commendation, to Angel Giroux. He's on the Governor's Latino Advisory Commission, uh, congratulating his efforts with his Gang Up uh, program. I want to have Angel stand just for a second and give uh, a round of applause. Also tonight, you should have already or will be getting index cards in the audience that you can ask questions about gangs, uh, what you can do, and, and no questions off limits. You can direct it to our panel members uh, or if you want to make a commentary, but uh, you'll be getting those cards momentarily and you can ask, we'll ask, have uh, questions later on in the program. We also have uh, with us tonight the main presenter, Peter James Jarak, he's the unit chief of the FBI, the Safe Streets and Gang Unit. He'll be our main speaker uh, this evening. But first of all, let me bring on uh, Congressman uh, Lou Barletta to open our program tonight and talk about how this started and where we've come in a little over a year now with this being the fourth program, but three others and where the laws stand and what needs to be done yet to keep this effort moving forward. So Congressman Barletta. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to uh, Arthur Street in this beautiful, uh, beautiful auditorium that I remember for such a long time. Because uh, you know, this is really where I uh, where I got my education uh, dealing with gangs. It was uh, during my time as the mayor of Hazelton uh, that I recognized, and we saw through the police department that we were having some problems here in town, and. Uh, it turned out that we were having some gang issues moving into the city. Now, Hazleton, as many of you know, is very, was a very quiet town, and it wasn't something that we were uh, that we saw very much of uh, this type of gang activity. And my first instinct, uh, as the mayor, was to uh, try to deal with this just through our police department, uh, to try to keep this among ourselves and and really not scare the residents or or make it known that, that we were having a problem. And you know maybe it was a little problem, it was something that we'd be able to take care of. But, but I soon realized that, uh, that this was probably the wrong thing for me to do. That if I was serious uh, about trying to attack this problem, it couldn't be something that we, we kept undercover. Uh, it couldn't be something, the problem was only going to get worse. And I remember, I remember going down to, uh, actually to the White House in December of 2005 uh, with the then Chief uh, uh, Bob Ferdinand and uh, Officer Leonard and the city administrator to talk about the problems that we were having here. Because we had a very small budget, we needed more police, uh, we didn't have the money to hire 
more officers and uh, we met with the Department of Justice on, on what we could do and, and uh, that's when I realized that this was much greater than, than something we could deal with with the police department, that, that we needed to uh, talk to the community. We needed a buy-in from the community. Uh, because as much as we always rely on on law enforcement and the police and and what they could do, see they were treating the problem after it was a problem, and we realized that if we wanted to get rid of gangs from our community, it was going to take more than just law enforcement doing what they could do. It was about educating parents and teachers and principals and superintendents and community leaders. It was about the community and parents recognizing what is a problem. Who are my children traveling with? Uh, what are the signs that they're possibly maybe uh, interacting with, with gangs? And it wasn't only going to stay in Hazleton. And that was evident. You know, we talk about jumping in a puddle. We can jump in a puddle here in Hazleton, but the water is just going to splash out somewhere else. And it takes community after community after community to work together to solve this problem. That means it's going to take all of our leaders, all of our parents and community to work together and recognize that we need to work with law enforcement. Not replace law enforcement, but work with law enforcement and that we do have a role uh, in making this a better place. And that's what this is all about. That's what Operation Gang Up is about. I'm very proud uh, to work with Senator John Yadichak to show that, that you know it doesn't matter. This is not a Republican and Democrat problem. This is a problem of making our communities a better place for our children and for us to live. So we, we are very fortunate to have this panel of experts uh, who will talk to us tonight in the fourth part of the five-part series. So thank you, and uh, we'll turn it back over to Andy. Okay, Congressman Boletta. <laughs> of course, State Senator Johnny Dechak uh, is a co-sponsor. It was a brain, uh, the, the idea with... Lou Barletta and John to organize these events. And I I'll always always call John every couple of weeks. How are those bills making their way through the Senate and the House, trying to make our anti real true anti gang laws? So we've made a lot of progress, Senator, and uh, it's it's good to hear. John, State Senator John Dechak. Thank you. Thank you very thank you very much, Andy, uh, and good evening to everyone. Let me, uh, let me begin tonight by extending uh, our deepest sympathies to the four Luzerne County families who lost children this past week. I know I speak for everyone when I say that our thoughts and prayers are with you. It's never been easy to grow up in any generation. There's always been a host of social pressures to challenge our young people, and added pressures of the Internet age have made it even more difficult for our children growing up today. Operation Gang Up and a safe school effort being led by Joe DeLuca at the Luzerne Intermediate Unit are motivated by one simple goal. We must provide our children with positive pathways in life and we must help them understand that their families and their communities value them. The task before us is not easy. Recent reports is in the newspapers highlight a growing trend in violent drug-related crime in northeastern Pennsylvania. Regrettably, as crime rates are rising, we are also witnessing a precipitous drop and decline in the number of full-time police officers on patrol in our communities. Just five of Luzerne County's 76 municipalities are full-time police departments, and a third have no police departments at all. Tonight's forum, law enforcement and you, will be an informative discussion on how we address gang-related crimes in our neighborhoods and in our schools. One thing Congressman Barletta and I have said from the start is this. There is no one solution to this problem, and we cannot expect one agency, whether it's a law enforcement agency or a government agency or one school or one leader to have an answer to this problem. It is going to take an engaged and united community to win the fight to keep our neighborhoods and schools safe. I want to thank our panel of experts tonight. And to all of you in the audience, you have made Operation Gang Up a tremendous success. You have come together as a community across a broad spectrum, and you have united to help save our kids and to save our neighborhoods. 
And the success has been remarkable. As Andy had mentioned, for the first time in Pennsylvania history, and I see my colleague, Representative Toolhill, I see my colleague, uh, Larry West, who represents Senator John Blake, and I know that Senator Baker and Senator John Rafferty and Senator Pileggi and Representative Kovulich have all been united in the effort to put Pennsylvania's first gang law on the books. And just this week, we moved the bills out of the Judiciary Committee, and we expect that they will move again this week in the appropriate committees and to the floor for action and get to the governor's desk before the end of the year. And those bills will do two very important things. They will toughen the sentencing on gang-related crime, and what I think is the most important thing that we can do, and it's one of the tools that was requested by law enforcement agencies, make it a crime for these gangs to recruit our kids. We don't want them preying on our kids, 10, 11, 12-year-old children in our elementary schools. We want to make it illegal for them to prey on these kids. That legislation is moving forward. That's happening because of all of you, the superintendents, the teachers, the parents, the leaders in our community that have come together. We now have four committees that are going strong. I'm being led by the Institute of Public Policy. The administrative agent for Operation Gang Up and Terry Holmes is here leading that charge. This is not going to be in. When the five forums are finished, it will not end. The fight will continue and it will be driven by united and engaged citizenry. We also will have announced, and it's active and you'll see it later today, our website, OperationGangUp.com. That'll be a tool for teachers, for parents, to get access and resources to what these gentlemen are going to talk about tonight in terms of how we can deal and get ahead of the gang problem before it becomes a street problem. And finally, I just want to add how grateful I am that tonight, with tonight's attendance, that we've reached over 1,000 citizens participating in Operation Gang Up. That's a community that cares. That's a community that wants to keep their schools, their neighborhoods, and their families safe. So thank you very much. You've made Operation Gang Up a tremendous success. Much work uh, continues. And finally, let me have one more thank you to our friend Andy Mahachek from WBRE. They've been a tremendous media partner in raising awareness, keeping people informed, and informed citizens, engaged citizens, united citizens, that's what's going to win this fight. Thank you very much for coming out. I just want to acknowledge our uh, panel of experts tonight, and if you have a brochure, their bios are on the back, but I just want them to uh, get some recognition. Let's start with uh, Hazelton Police Chief Frank D'Andrea. Trooper Kent Lane, Pennsylvania State Police. Robert McGuire, Captain Intelligence at Lackawanna County Prison. Chris Orozco, Hazel's Detective Task Force. The Luzerne County District Attorney, Stephanie Salvantis. Gary Shevlin, former Senior Executive Manager at U.S. Marshals, Gary. Kevin Vodado, Senior Supervisor, Special Agent, FBI Scranton. And let me uh, bring on our main speaker, our presenter tonight, Peter James Jarak. He's the Unit Chief of the FBI, Safe Streets and Gang Unit. Very quickly, Peter Jarak began with the FBI on February 24, 2002. After graduating from the FBI Academy, Jarak, Special Agent, was assigned to the Chicago Division, where he worked on a drug squad specializing in Mexican-Colombian drug cartels. And in August of 2006, he was assigned to an Italian organized crime squad, where he worked for two and a half years. And now his specialty is fighting street gangs and profiling where they come from and how communities can fight back. So without uh, further ado, Peter James, Special Agent Jarak from the FBI. I'm going to put this up here because sometimes my voice can be a little overwhelming in a microphone. I'd like to thank you for the invitation to uh, come and speak to you here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about FBI strategy on gangs and talk a little bit from the national perspective and then take it down to a local level and talk about how integrated law enforcement can work with community to have significant and lasting community impact. The fight on gangs we can't do anything in the FBI with a without a PowerPoint, so that'll come up here shortly, all right? 
the uh, the fight on the fight on gangs, as has been mentioned previously, is a is a universal fight. We cannot do it without the help of the community. Law enforcement overall spends a lot of time, both on a local level, on a state level, and on a federal level, prosecuting cases. The gang fight, if you look at the gang fight in the 1920s and the gang fight currently, it's like saying that these two individuals play the same sport. They do play the same sport, football, but it's a completely different game than it was in the 1920s. And gangs of today are evolving continuously. In the next slide, what you'll see is linkages to, to crime. Gangs have evolved in, from their typical pattern behavior, which was drug trafficking and weapons trafficking, into all sorts of things, into every fabric of society, into all crimes imaginable. One of the trends that we're seeing presently is that gangs are becoming increasingly involved in uh, prostitution, including turning young women, 15, 16, 17 year olds, who are runaways, who are vulnerable and they're uh, making them into prostitutes and they're trafficking these ladies all around uh, the United States. But you can see it touches all areas of the United States, whether it's violent crime, whether it's mortgage fraud, gangs are gonna be involved in uh, whatever they can do to make the most money in the shortest period of time. Now generally that is narcotics. Narcotics is a cash business, it's very easy uh, to get narcotics and move them from a cartel level to a street level to the user. And that, that cash in hand, that money transacting, often breeds the violence that we see because if you have neighborhood-based gangs that are concerned about their economic lifeline, their well-being, which is their drug trade, they're very concerned about their turf. They're very concerned about the neighborhood in which they operate. They don't want somebody coming in and stealing their livelihood. So that's where a lot of the violence that we see, and increasingly we're seeing violence between local neighborhood crews. Not so much the national levels as you might have seen in the 80s and 90s. Everyone knows about the Bloods and Crips, but they don't often hear about the, the gang that's a local group that came from the corner of Walk and Don't Walk, a four block area in a small town. And that's where we're seeing the trends right now. So what is the FBI doing in general with the, uh, with the crime problem and with the gang problem? In 1992, if you remember, President Clinton was taking office at the time the economy was much in the same state as it is today. We were in a recession nationally. One of the premises that President Clinton ran on was 100,000 more police officers on the street. And out of that was born the Violent Crime Initiative and the Safe Streets Gang Initiative. Presently, we have 164 gang task forces all across the country. We have 829 special agents assigned to it and over 1,400 uh, task force officers, including 92 uh, other federal partners. Now, that doesn't look like a lot. I was a police officer in the city of Virginia Beach for about five years. My police department had about 850 people patrolling a population of about 400 to 500,000 people. So we have 829 special agents assigned to a population of 305 million. That's a band-aid on a gaping wound. So we cannot do it alone, which is why we partner with our state and locals to have the maximum impact. Almost like a special forces group, we work as force multipliers to do as much as we can, whether it's on the local level, the state level, or the federal level. On the next slide, you'll see where we are across the country presently. And if you focus on the Northeast, specifically Northeastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia Division is the division in which we're, we are presently. They have the most gang task forces of any division of our 56 across the United States. They have nine in Philadelphia Division. You'll notice that most of these areas, these are by counties and by regions here, we divide up the country in a, into five regions, that most of these are in your major metropolitan areas. But as I mentioned previously, what we're seeing now is a trend from uh, that the gangs that used to be centered in our major cities of the United States are now moving out to rural communities. I'll give you an example. I worked in Chicago for almost seven years, and in that time, one of the most notorious housing projects in the United States called Cabrini Green. The city of Chicago decided that it was a blight for long enough and they started knocking down the almost 100 buildings that were there. Well, what happened with the people that lived in those buildings? Well, they moved. They moved to the suburbs and they moved to other communities. And a great example of that is Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is three hours west of the city of Chicago on Interstate 80. In 2009, they had a 150% increase in shootings. Why? Well, because if you, knock down an, uh, if you knock down one group and you move them out, they're gonna find a new place to, to, to sit and set up shop, and that's exactly what happened. 
The Four Corner Hustlers and the Vice Lords and the Gangster Disciples, if they didn't get along in the city of Chicago, they're not going to get along in the field of dreams. So that's exactly what happened in those areas. And that's what we're seeing all across the country, which is why if you look at Nebraska, right smack dab in the middle of the country, you see about two thirds of the state covered by gang task forces there. That's because these gangs are leaving Omaha and other places and they're starting to infiltrate smaller communities. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Hazleton is a relatively small town. It's between major cities and you see people coming from major cities and moving out to the small towns and set up shop. And part of that is because the law enforcement at the time may not have been appropriately trained to A, recognize gang, and B, combat gangs. Next slide, please. So our national gang strategy is, is such that in the early 80s, the FBI was given the authority to investigate drug matters, which is, is considered Title 21 in the U.S. Code. Congress liked the fact that the FBI had worked very hard at rooting out mafia all across the United States. And what they wanted the FBI to do was tackle the gang problem and the drug problem in the same manner. So just like if you were to go to a doctor and get a diagnosis of cancer, you wouldn't ask the doctor to remove only part of your tumor. The FBI removes the entire tumor. And that's basically what the enterprise theory of investigation is in a nutshell. We don't care if you're at the top, if you're the godfather, if you're the shot caller, or if you're at the bottom slinging dope, uh, moving guns, moving money. We try and take everyone in the entire criminal enterprise and work them in a case, whether it's a RICO case, which is a statute that was uh, created in the 1970s to combat uh, Italian organized crime, or whether it's a narcotic statute, whether it's a conspiracy, whether it's a, a Vicar or a continuing com criminal enterprise statute, that's what we use to employ. And the tools that we, that we use are the violent gang Safe Streets Task Forces. We work a lot with local prosecutors, with state prosecutors, and with federal prosecutors to devise the best possible scheme, whether it is on a state level. In a lot of cases, state laws may be stronger than a federal law in an area, or whether it's a federal situation. Again, I told you that I worked in the city of Chicago. Uh, we'd run into people all the time that had been arrested nine times with zero convictions. How does a community react when you have an individual who keeps getting arrested and then is immediately out and doing the same thing. There's a loss of faith in the judicial system. And so what we try and do is bring those individuals into the federal system. Because in the federal system, if you get sentenced to time, you're going to do 85% of that time. In a state system, you may only get 50% if you're lucky, or 40%. So a lot of times the federal hammer, as we like to say, it carries a lot more weight than, than the state and local. Next slide, please. Again. Enterprise theory of investigation, we want to focus on the leaders. A lot of times you hear that if you cut off the head of the snake, the body of the snake will die. Well, we want to target the head of the snake. We want to target those individuals that are making those decisions on behalf of the gang. But we also want to take out the entire enterprise. We focus not on the fact that they are in a gang. It is not against the law to be a member of a gang, just like it's not against the law to be a member of the Boy Scouts. What we target is the criminal activity that's associated with that gang. So we look at whether it's, again, shooting individuals, committing assaults, extorting people, drug dealing. That's what we target. And again, focus on a, a pattern of activity as opposed to individual isolated incidents. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, as part of the enterprise theory, we want to make sure that the judicial system is not a revolving door of justice. We don't want to uh, use a traditional law enforcement model and the best example I can give is when I worked patrol and we were, we were just learning about community policing initiatives, one of the things that was said is, if there's a rock pile in the street and there are kids throwing rocks at passing cars, a good citizen calls 911 and says, there's somebody out here throwing rocks at a car. A good police officer that I am, I'm going to go to the scene. What's going to happen to those kids? They're going to run away. Case solved, right? I've done my job. The kids are gone. What happens when I leave? The kids come running right back and they start throwing rocks at the car. So as a police officer, if I'm using a community policing, if I want to have a lasting impact, I don't chase the kids off, I move the rock pile. So that's what we're trying to do in terms of having a lasting community impact. We want to have the appearance in the community, the buy-in from the community, that what we are doing is actually working. That you're not seeing the same actors on and on and on again that they're actually being put away for a long period of time and you're effectively removing that cancer from your community. Next slide, please. So, bottom line is we want to tail, tailor our investigation towards a command and control 
We want to use our tactical assets. We want to use our intelligence-driven investigations. We want to use asset forfeiture as a tool, and we want to dismantle the entire enterprise. Next slide. Some of the things that I want to touch on as, as that are different techniques that have been employed across the country. First one there is called civil injunctions. The state of California, about 20 years ago, went to civil injunctions as a way to enforce some, some codes. Local law enforcement was doing their best against gangs, but were having a, uh, they were fighting an uphill battle. They learned to start using nuisance abatement laws and declaring areas nuisance areas and forbidding certain things. For example, they were targeting the fact that the gang members were either wearing clothes, indicating they were members of gangs in a certain area. So if you had an abandoned house that was being used as a drug front, you could not only make it a no trespassing area, but you could put a civil injunction on any of the gang members within a four block area. They were banned. So effectively, you've now moved them out. You're allowing the community to reclaim that area. Very innovative. The studies that have been done have shown that crime actually does go down when these civil injunctions are in place. And there are other states now looking at how to do civil injunctions. And I would recommend that as another tool. Again, thinking outside of the box of traditional law enforcement. Gang validation is another one. Gang validation is, again, something that is being pioneered in California through the prison system. Uh, what they are looking at is not just a single incident of validating an individual as a gang member. We hear all the time of someone saying, oh, that's just a gang member. Well, how do you know he's a gang member? How do you know she's a gang member? Are they members or are they associates of the gang? What type of indicia show that they are truly a member of that gang? Is it tattoos? Is it clothing? Is it intelligence? Is it communication? What have you got on these individuals? And they use it on a different point scale. And once an individual has accumulated a certain number of points, they are validated. Currently, in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, between the prison population and the parolee population, which consists of about 300,000 individuals, they have 150,000 validated gang members. That's substantial in a prison system. And what we're seeing as a trend nationally is the prison is exerting much more influence over the street than ever before. This is particularly the case on the West Coast and the East Coast, and it's making its way to the center of the United States. The last two things I'll touch on are the, uh, the VIGTOF, the Violent Gang Terrorist Organization file, which is now morphed into this violent offender file. And this is something that the FBI is doing to help local law enforcement. We have seen a spike recently in law enforcement involved shootings and law enforcement involved deaths. And some of these things are preventable. An individual who is out, who has a history of assaulting law enforcement, of shooting at law enforcement, if uh, I'm a trooper on the road and I pull somebody over, as soon as I run that tag on the violent offender file, the violent person file, there's going to be a hit that comes up that tells me as the trooper that this individual could possibly be in this vehicle, has assaulted law enforcement previously, and I may want to call for backup right then and there. We see it in a lot of instances recently. Um, I, I opened my email this morning before I left. There were four more law enforcement related deaths uh, last week. So this is an increasing trend. And the Bureau is trying to use some of the tools that we have at our disposal to help local law enforcement. Next slide, please. One of the methods that, uh, that we tout, and it's not unique to our organization, but we, we very much advocate a task force approach. A task force approach allows multiple parties from different levels within the community, again, local, state, and federal, to act together. We share our resources, we pool our experience together, and we attack the problem as a, as a group. One of the things that I like to say is, almost like an insurgent strategy, a counterinsurgency strategy as was employed in Iraq and Afghanistan, very much the same policy with gangs, a clear and hold strategy. If you're gonna go into a neighborhood and you wanna root out the problems in that neighborhood, you don't just want to vacate the area and let everyone come running back in. You want to hold that community and you want to continue to expand your grasp of those communities on and on and on. You want to have lasting community impact. And that's one of the things that we are advocating. We're spending quite a bit of time right now about how to measure that. How do you measure what community impact is? How do you have lasting community impact? We've always talked about disrupting criminal activity and dismantling a criminal enterprise. But what we're also talking about is how do you have substantial community impact? And I'll give you an example before I close. Several years ago, Los Angeles Field Office did a phenomenal case on a Piru Blood uh, set in California. They arrested about 50 members of the gang. 
Great success for the Bureau, for LAPD, and for our other law enforcement partners. Within two years, that gang had completely reconstituted themselves and were wreaking havoc in that same community. The investigation had been a success, but there had been no lasting community impact there. So what they did is when they started another investigation on this group, and they started bu building conspiracy case, doing drug buys, doing weapons buys on all the leaders of the organization, on all the runners, was they started partnering with all the other social services that were out there. They partnered with the apartment complex that owned that area. And they started looking at environmental things. Why are there abandoned cars everywhere that these individuals are hiding guns in, are hiding drugs in? Why are there abandoned houses? Why do none of the street lights work? Why are the fences all down? And they started looking at all these things and they saw trash all over the place. They worked with Streets and Sanitation. When they did their takedown, they removed 28 tons of trash from the neighborhood. They cleaned up the neighborhood. They allowed the, the community to basically feel that they had a toehold again within that community to start saying, yes, we're making a difference. And that community is now basically a beacon of light uh, compared to the surrounding communities for that exact reason. They went in, they removed the cancer, and they continued to saturate the area, both with police resources and with community, municipal, and state resources to make sure that the, the gang stayed out. And that's exactly what happened. So my challenge to you today is to make sure that if, if going forward, working with these fine men and women who are up here, tackling the gang problem in your area, is to make sure that you have lasting community impact here in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I think that's my last slide. Okay, thank you very much. Special Agent Drack, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to start our conversation now with our panelists. Have you received your index cards? Anyone have any more questions out there that have not been handed in? I guess there's some folks still looking for some index cards for questions. Uh, let me start off, first of all, with uh, these are some of the questions that were given to me before. Do gangs target, and, and I'll throw this out there, whoever wants to answer the question, uh, just feel free to jump in, okay? Do gangs target average citizens, people minding their own business? Do they technically, do they specifically target your average citizen in the neighborhood? Yeah. Um, I think any criminal targets an average citizen. I think uh, if, if you interviewed 10,000 criminals, you'd probably get the same response. Uh, you look for the path of least resistance. If you look at 10 houses in a row and you see one that's got a dog or an alarm system and you want to commit a burglary, you're going to avoid those houses and you're going to look at the people who leave their doors open and their windows open at night. And I would say that if you're looking at from gang members, uh, it's again, it's about the crime that's being committed. What crime is being committed against those average citizens? Um, there's always a, the statement that if, that if you make yourself appear as a target, you will be a target. All of us are average yeah. citizens. Yeah. That's a good question. I have to qualify. What is an average citizen? My opinion is that somebody who just goes to work every day, tries to do the right thing, and works hard. A law-abiding citizen. A law right. And right. abides by the laws. They may not agree with the laws, but they abide by the laws, I think. OK. Uh, what gangs are known to exist and operate in northeastern Pennsylvania? Do we know, Chris? It's one of the things that we get these questions a lot. What are the gangs that are operating? And I think that's one of the, the things that we kind of agree in law enforcement. And we don't really give them the notoriety of naming them. Uh, we have gangs. We have a variety of different gangs. But there's really, we, I serve, uh, myself and Ken Lane, we see no purpose served in naming them. Because uh, it just gives them notoriety and it gives them uh, recognition, which I don't think they deserve. So typically, uh, we, the answer is we don't name them by name, but yes, we have a variety of different gangs uh, operating in our area. Right. I, think, I think on top of that, Chris, is we want, and the agent mentioned it, you, you need to look in your own communities for homegrown gangs that are, that, that, that are starting, like you said, uh, don't walk and uh, walk. You, know, um, you need to look for those homegrown street gangs, too. Um, and not focus on the colors and everything else of nationally known gangs. Um, we need to know what's going on in certain neighborhoods. Question for Chief DeAndrea. 
why at times do, does it seem that in Hazleton things are kept quiet so it's not, not we should know more about gang activity. It seems so secretive at, at times. Of course, the tough question is to throw at the chief here. No, I actually think so what are you hiding? Yeah, everything. Um, I, I try to be as, as transparent as possible, especially with the media, with press conferences. If anyone lives anywhere in the area, you'll see that uh, I am often uh, exposing anything that I can to the media, to the public. I actually believe that in past administrations, perhaps there wasn't that much information sharing for whatever reason. Um, I feel it's a tool because I actually believe that it's all about education. And now I need to educate the public on exactly what our problems are because you're going to be my solution. A huge portion of the solution for correcting the problems in the town from the police standpoint is the community's involvement. And so um, I'm hoping that if anybody felt that in the past things were hidden, that that is changing. Now, as a caveat, I have to add that there are often times where because of the investigation, whether because it's ongoing or the sensitive nature of what was involved out of respect to a family or to victims, there are just things that cannot be released, as well as um, when uh, Detective Orozco just stated, there are sometimes you don't talk about things because you don't want to, to give anybody that, that specific publicity because that's a lot of times what criminals feed on. So uh, the answer is multifaceted. Uh, I'm hoping that I could expose as much as possible and, and meet with the, the media as often as possible to keep the community informed. But there will always be things in law enforcement that are law enforcement sensitive and cannot be shared. And if I can add, I would have to agree with the chief. Um, there are a lot of the times that we sit down and we'd love to share information with the community and let them know what is going on. And I know there are a lot of the times that they come to us and they want answers. But because, like he said, because of the ongoing nature of the investigation, the last thing we want to do is hinder that investigation, jeopardize what could be done in the courtroom to actually resolve what, did, what was done on the streets. So that is the reason why we have to hold back and we can't divulge as much information as we'd like. Okay, this question is from Ed Payne, uh, Ed Payne from Sorrento Gardens. If drug use declines, does it weaken gang influence, and how can we increase funding for those efforts to prevent use in young people? What impact would it have if we could, if we could decrease the dependency on drugs, drug addiction? Not all gang members are drug users. Um, I think you're gonna find out in a lot of cases, gang members do not use the drug themselves, they sell it for the profits. Uh, gangs are not exclusively drug dealers either. Uh, they're turning to prostitution. They're actually now turning to identity theft. Uh, they're getting, um, uh, they're, they're actually, uh, we're finding out, uh, um, co uh, actually uh, cooperating with or extorting members of banking communities where they will now create checks and have individuals that work in banks going white collar way to steal money uh, through banks. So just the reduction in, in gang or if use of drugs might take away one form of profit earning for these, these uh, individuals, uh, but that's not their only way of doing it. Uh, so yes, it would be great to reduce drug use and the community would probably benefit from drug use, but that's not gonna be the only way to, to remove a, a gang from a community. Why can't the federal government help the Hazleton Police Department with revenue to combat crime and clean up our town? We need help, signed Antonio. I, I'd like oh. to take that. Question for <laughs> Congressman Lou Barletta. <laughs> Is Lou in the house? Lou. Yeah. Fighting a problem like this, Antonio, is not always about just throwing money. You know, as you can see, we have some very talented 
uh, agents from, from the FBI uh, and making sure that they have the funding that they need to, uh, uh, to do their job is always going to be a priority for me. Uh, but the reason we started a program like this is to assist law enforcement and realize we can't just throw it into their hands. Uh, that's, that's not going to solve our problem. It goes much further than that, and it's many things that money can't buy, and that's you know, parents at home getting involved with their children, uh, getting involved with their children's lives and who they're with and making sure they're doing their work at school and making sure uh, they know where their children are after school. It's more than just, just money. Uh, but I can tell you, I personally, as a member of Congress, will always make sure that our law enforcement has what they need uh, to do their job. But I think we all share in a responsibility of, uh, of this problem of crime. I'm asking you to make some noise in Congress. Well, Antonio, there's no... There, there, there are no earmarks allowed in Congress where, where we could direct money to one specific project. But what we can do is make sure that agencies like the, like the FBI and, and law enforcement agencies, and I have, I've gone to the floor uh, and fought for COPS programs, COPS grants uh, that communities can use. Uh, you know, to help their local law enforcement. So we need to make sure. I never take my mayor's hat off when I'm down in Congress, and I never, ever, ever forget about Hazleton and, and where we come from in trying to do uh, what we can financially. But I think, again, as I said, we all share in a responsibility in helping law enforcement and working together uh, that we raise our children and keep an eye on what's going on. But Thank you, Congressman. If I can add to that, Antonio, please. Um, I, I greatly appreciate the passion of the community and how they're looking to help me. But as we sit here at this table, I, I've become extremely close friends with everybody who's up here. And the reason is the federal government pays the FBI's salary. Most of our latest large-scale arrests have been taken over and made by the FBI. And that's because we have a member of the Hazel Police Department who's allowed to sit on that task force. It's the same with the state police, who we constantly partner with, who I have a detective on a task force with them, and that becomes a force multiplier. It's the same with the district attorney's office, who has a detective assigned to our gang task force. And so, the last thing I ever want to do is upset the congressman, have him thinking that we're saying you're not helping. You are definitely, absolutely helping. I'm gracious to the community who's looking for more solutions. I recognize that the senator and the congressman are constantly looking for ways to help the community. But the, but the thing that I, I would say slightly upsets me is to look around this room because if you all look around this room, you'll see a lot of empty seats. I have no idea where you will ever find a panel, not myself, but these experts, congressmen, senators, who put something like this together, and we can't even fill a room, because it's about the community, and it's free. It's community involvement that's gonna save our community. And so, before I quickly want to run to somebody else and demand help, I need to help myself. And so my suggestion would be, for the next panel that comes up, you all urge everybody else in this community to be willing to get involved. There you go. Okay, Antonio. Go ahead. One of the things that has been thrown out here is the term force multiplier, in that the federal, state, and local officials work together. The biggest force multiplier that we as law enforcement have uh, has is the community. The eyes and the ears of the people who walk the streets where these neighborhood violent gangs actually commit these crimes. 
uh, the, the, the first clue to law enforcement that something is amiss could be the neighbor sitting on their front porch uh, walk, letting their dog out to go to the bathroom and all of a sudden they notice six or seven people walking down the street wearing the same color shirts, wearing their hats in a, the same way, greeting each other with a certain handshake. If that person takes the time to make the phone call to local law enforcement and advise them of what they saw, uh, the local representative from the law enforcement has patrol go through there, patrol picks up on what's going on, patrol reports it to their vice unit or to a task force, that's the force multiplier that in all reality rests with you individuals out there. If you see this happening on your street and you turn around and you go back inside and turn on CNN and scream at the, uh, the, the television, you're not, you're not helping us become the force multiplier that we can become because of what you saw. When that patrol unit goes uh, cruising down the street, the, the hats are gonna come back on the other way and so they're, they're not gonna do, but the eyes and ears of the community is, is what the, the biggest force multiplier that's out there and no senator, no congressman can mandate that or make that a law anywhere else. But the individual responsibility to step up and say, I wanna protect my street and I'm not gonna let those thugs take over, rest in the community. Then put it to us, let us do what we do, and it will go from there. And, and going off of what Kevin's saying, I always say when I go out and I speak to crime watch groups, I tell them that you are the ones that they are the most scared of. It's not the uniformed police officers walking the streets because they could see them a mile away. It's the people that they see in their grocery stores, they, the people surrounding them on a daily basis that notice everything and remain vigilant every day as to what is going on in their neighborhoods. That is what is going to help our community. And don't think, I've had a lot of questions directed at me as to, we've, we've called the cops, we told them about this, nothing's being done. Give it time. It takes time to investi investigate. It takes time to go in and monitor and, and watch what is going on. If there is a gang next door, we can't just barge in off of this person said this. We need to do the investigation. So it, you just have to remain patient and law enforcement will do their job. And anybody here tonight that does not belong to their local crime watch group, get involved with it. And if you do belong, I challenge you to bring somebody to the next meeting from your neighborhood. Communities need to take pride in their own neighborhoods. That's where this is all gonna start. That's what we keep repeating up here. It's, it starts in your neighborhood with you. Andy, I just want to get back to the, the gentleman there about the money situation. Um, I'm kind of the outsider here. I'm not from this area. I was actually I was stationed with the U.S. Marshals from 1990-1995 up here, but uh, I retired from Philadelphia in 2009. But when I first started in law enforcement, federal law enforcement, there was never any cooperation between states, locals, or federal. I mean, they were all three different entities. As the years went on, task forces started forming. The FBI has task forces, U.S. Marshals have task forces, and they're mainly to help the state and local governments, not the federal government. Whenever any criminal enterprise is taken down and the assets are seized, it goes into an asset forfeiture fund. Now, that money doesn't go to the federal government. That is all distributed to the state and locals who participated on those task forces. So if Hazleton PD has someone on the FBI task force and say, for example, $300,000 are, are seized uh, and eventually sold and forfeited to the government, that money goes back to the state and local agencies who, who participate in that task force. So they are getting money essentially not directly from the federal government, but because of the federal government. So they do receive money. And, and sometimes it is a substantial amount. Okay, is there, next question, is there evidence that we have organized gangs within our city limits, or is it just individual gang members coming into the city and I'll extend to the area from other areas to commit crimes? Chris? There, there are definitely organized groups within the city, uh, but they're not just within the city limits. Uh, they're within our area. Uh, we have gangs that operate uh, within Hazleton, within Wilkesbury, up into Scranton, down into Pottsville. Uh, I think sometimes Hazleton gets a 
reputation of well, Hazleton has gangs. Yes, Hazleton has gangs, but if you live in an, uh, in McAdoo and in, in Pottsville and in, in, in Drums, and you don't think that there are gangs that are operating in those areas, you're fooling yourself. Just like you can drive from Hazleton to Wilkesbury, it's very easy for them to do the same. Uh, and we have seen through the last six years that Kent Lane and myself have been doing this is the connections between along the I-81 and 80 corridor. They are getting uh, more and more entrenched. We are seeing people from Pottsville going up to Scranton. We see people from <coughs> Stroudsburg going up to Bloom. Uh, they are they are taking the, just the same roads that you would take. They are taking the same roads. We are seeing, yes, to individual members, but we are seeing organizations as well. There's a big difference when they use the roads and when we use the roads. Most of you grew up in the city of Hazel. You might not have had a fence, but you knew where your yard ended and your neighbors stopped, started. And you stayed off your neighbor's yard because you respected boundaries. You've got to sort of get out of the mindset of thinking like a law-abiding citizen when you try to understand the magnitude and the breadth of this problem because criminals do not respect <coughs> boundaries. So to say Hazleton has a gang problem and Beaver Meadows or Carbon County or Schuylkill County or Monroe County or Columbia County does not is inaccurate because we're the only ones Police jurisdictions buy and stops at the city line. The state police from Troop N. Hazelton might start a stop in Luzerne or Carbon County. Uh, the problem becomes the criminals don't care if you live across 23rd Street in Hazel Township. If they're going to rob your house, they're going to rob your house. They don't say, oh, we can't go over there. That's the township. Well, we've got to stay in the city when we're going to commit our crime. It's the same thing with gangs. They're out to make money. You know, they're, they're organized criminals. They don't care. And, and, and we just gave um, the most recent convenience store robberies, 11 of them. Again, the FBI was gracious enough to take that off of my hands and free my detectives back up to deal with the homicides that we've recently had and some of the rapes. It's one less incident that I have to assign three people to to get this through court, which would have been a Herculean task. But those 11 convenience store robberies covered three counties and used the interstate. So there are no boundaries when you talk about a criminal. And a lot of times, criminals will do just that. They go somewhere else to commit a crime, and then they come back here. They go over here and commit a crime, and then they come back. It's like the hole-in-the-wall gang, where they had a hideout, and they went over here, and they did something, and they come back. So it becomes all that more important for us to share all of our information among all of these agencies. You know, it's actually pleasant in an odd sort of way that at 4.30 in the afternoon when I'm getting ready to go tape a television show, I'm getting a phone call from the district attorney asking me about the most recent incident in the city of which I didn't hear about yet. It's that type of being in tune and having a network where Naturally, then I, I immediately call and find out that yes, in fact, she's correct. And but and it's then that we work network. together, right? <laughs> exactly. Then we work, but, and that's it. That's what it's about. But it's not going to be. Uh, we will not, if I could please coin your phrase, Ed Payne. We will not arrest our way out of this problem, and that's where the community comes in. It's going to be a joint effort among all of us and all of you. And we're going to have to think out of the box to come up with the solution that will not only take the town back, but the community and the county, and it just continues to grow. It's, it's, a, it's a northeast. This started off, the Operation Gang Up started off as a northeast Pennsylvania issue. Um, we're tackling it. And, and now you, you heard uh, Senator Ujicak earlier with Representative Toolhill. They're, they're working on creating laws for the state of Pennsylvania, which there was none. Um, you know, I challenge anybody, I guarantee you every community in this country has some form of a gang issue in it. It's, it's everywhere. It's just we're being proactive. We're trying to educate the teachers and the community because that's where it starts. 
that before anybody up at this table brings anybody into a prison system related with gangs, the school teachers and the community are the first ones that are seeing this. They need to report that at the first sign. The notes, the notes, the, the, the notes, uh, note taking starts there and sharing of information. So you may see this in, in a community down here or a neighborhood down here. You call about your neighborhood, well, people over on the other side of town are calling about the same type of thing. Well, now you know that there's, there's a, a bigger group than just the little neighborhood that you're talking about, wearing the same colors and, and, and doing these types of things. It's just the little notes and you can refer back to that as it grows and these guys put their investigations together. What happened to John Doe warrants to be able to pick up members and friends known to disrupt the gang, to be part of gangs? John Doe warrants. Or is that too deep legally? The bottom line is there's not a criminal violation for being a member of a gang. Uh, and you have to have probable cause, the last time I checked, to get an arrest warrant through the district attorney's office or through the United States Attorney's Office, and just indicating that John Doe is a member of a gang and needs to be arrested, uh, I'm fairly certain that the officer attempting to serve that warrant would he himself or her, her herself end up being charged with a civil rights violation. Um, the, one of the efforts that's being made is uh, to potentially have a law within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to arrest somebody for, but until that happens, it's not illegal to be a gang member. Um, it, back in the 70s, right? Pardon me? We still have them. As a matter of fact, uh, we've arrested both John and Jane Doe often in the city. We still have John Doe warrants. The issue that, or the, the point that Kevin and uh, District Attorney Salavantis are making is. Just because it's a John Doe warrant doesn't mean that you don't have to have the appropriate um, probable cause and or facts. The John Doe warrant is based on you have all of your probable cause but don't know the person's name. It's not just a blanket warrant to then say, oh, I'm going to arrest anybody that associated with. You have to have all of the specifics for one single individual and then the only thing missing from your affidavit of probable cause is the person's name. That becomes John or Jane Doe. But you still have to, it's, it's no different than if you knew their name or didn't. You're just filling in John Doe until you get their name. But Thank we, you. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't look at arrest stats much because I don't think arrest stats matter that, that much. To me, it's all about a conviction. I'm going to arrest all of you in this room for being on school property after dark. Is that arrest going to stand up in court? No, and, these pe and you're going to be right back out on the street. For us, it's about conviction. Uh, you have to be able to put a viable case together on a group of individuals who are committing crimes, and then you need to put those individuals behind bars for a long period of time. And that's how you're effective. Simply arresting individuals, as the chief said, you cannot arrest your way out of a problem. It can do some damage. It may, it may help in the short term, but a long-term solution, it's not a viable solution. Let me ask this question to uh, Special Agent Girac. Based on your experience and what you see around the country, is our area really, you know, a lot of times in, in the media we hear, we see what's happening here, and I'm looking back and saying that happened in Reading and Allentown 20 years ago. Are what we seeing, is what we're seeing in northeastern Pennsylvania that unique? I wouldn't say it's, it's unique. I think, um, like most crimes, th drug use goes in cycles. Who would have thought in the 70s when heroin was in its heyday that it would come again in the 90s? I worked property crimes for a while in, in Virginia Beach, and of the 15 burglaries I worked, 12 were heroin addict related. Um, and then that has subsided, and then a new drug takes its place. And you see that where you have other drugs that come forward. Same thing with gangs. We, we knew that there were national gangs. Everyone has heard of Bloods and Crips and some of these other groups that are out there. And there are ebbs and flows in all these things. I don't think this is, it's a unique, uh, certainly not unique to this area. I think what you will see that is unique is that there is a definite, there are definite patterns of migration that are happening with gangs now. And that pattern that we're seeing nationally, and I think there, we brought about 30 books, these national gang assessments for 2011, if you have one, hold it up. Um, but that will give you a, a gang picture, thank you, sir. That'll give you a gang picture of what's happen, happening nationally. 
And the last time they do these every two years, in 2009 when they did the assessment, we rely on local law enforcement and their statistics to uh, report to the, to the national government. There were a million gang members. When they did the assessment in 2011, there was 1.4 million gang members nationwide. So either we're getting better at counting individuals or there's a problem that's increasing. And I think the problem that you're seeing is that A, people are more aware of what gang members look like, what gang associates look like, and uh, you're seeing more and more rural communities uh, suburbs who are affected. What used to be quote, quote unquote an inner city problem is now a problem for all communities. So short answer to your question, no, this is not unique. Okay, question. Uh, our crime watch group has dwindled down to two people. It seems uh, people are terrified of calling police and getting involved. Do you have any ideas how we can convince them by not getting involved, the situation only gets worse? A lot of ways to convince them, and um, I'm going to take a lot of that burden on myself because I, I believe in crime watches. I mean, I look back to the back of the room, and there's Arthur Street, and in the center of the room is Alter Street, and here's Laurel Street and Birch Knoll, and there are crime watches, whether they're starting to dwindle or they're dwindling.